Hello and welcome. My name is Penny Sansevieri and I am with Author of Marketing Experts. We are a full service marketing and publicity firm. And the class today is really focused on some strategic, perhaps creative things that you can do to help you boost more books, but also kind of figuring out where the holes are in your campaign. So what's really going wrong and what you can do to fix it. So the first question that a lot of authors ask me is, how should I market my book? And I get this question a lot, and it, it's not necessarily a bad question, but I'm gonna talk you through a little bit of maybe how to rephrase it. The second question I get is, will any of this help me to sell more books? Which obviously is the goal for all of us. But the problem is, is that that's actually a wrong thing to focus on. Because the thing that sells books is exposure. And so a better question would be, which marketing actions will help me get more exposure? And that's really what we are, that is really what we're gonna focus on in this particular session is marketing actions and things that you can do to get your mind kind of away from, I really need to sell books, which again, we all need to do, but it tends to be the wrong action to focus on. Repetitive book, Exposure really helps to sell more books. So that's what we're going to dig into is some repetitive exposure, some things even that you can tweak and kind of, you know, set it and forget it, which is always nice. So it's not necessarily what I'm, what I'm not saying in this class is that you have to be out there marketing 24 seven a day. That's not it at all. And hopefully by the end, you'll kind of get a sense of, of what I am talking about. 95% of books are sold word of mouth, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, because we're spending a lot of time running ads, maybe doing Amazon ads, which I do and I love, as long as you manage them correctly, because we all know that sometimes they can cost you a lot of money. So, but really when it comes down to it, is the thing that really sells more books are people telling other people. And when you think about the last, for example, anything, whether it was a book or something new that you acquired, there's a really good chance that it was recommended to you by somebody that you trust. Maybe it was a neighbor, maybe it was somebody that you see on a regular basis, but maybe it was also somebody on social media that you follow and you think, oh, I really trust this person. All of those things are reasons to consider as you're marketing your book and building your fan base, which we're also gonna talk about in this class, as well as kind of realigning where you spend your time marketing. So first let's talk about how to find your path because it, it doesn't, you know, I don't even need to say you're, you're in, you're, you're attending this really wonderful series of classes and workshops that Alliance of Independent Authors is offering. And you know that there's a lot of stuff that you could be doing. Not all of it necessarily matters to your market. So a really quick way to find what you should be doing is to um, figure out what other similar authors are doing in your, in your market. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that you copy them, but it is a good idea to get to know other people in your, in your industry, maybe even just kind of perusing their website. You don't necessarily have to meet them for coffee. Perusing their website, following them on social, following their blog, see what they talk about, because success leaves clues. So authors who are really successful, who you admire, are going to help to kind of show you the way. The second piece of this, and we have a lot of, there are several links in this um, presentation to things like the reader profile and a free marketing journal guide to kind of guide you through some of the daily marketing things that you may want to do. Um, and all of those links will be at the end of the class. But what I want to encourage you to do is to hyper focus on your reader because a lot of times we end up starting, we end up focusing very wide, which doesn't help our marketing. It creates too broad of a, it creates too broad of a target for us to really hit. So we'll narrow this down a little bit more, but let's first take a look at what your marketing pie chart looks like. Now, you're gonna be very surprised by this pie chart, I would imagine, because the smallest, one of the smallest pieces of this is social media. 
where you're spending 10% of your time. Now, I'm not saying that social media is bad. I think social media can be really great when it's used appropriately for your marketing because you, we all know, and I can't see you because you're listening to this after I've recorded it, but I'm going to assume that many of you are probably nodding thinking, oh my gosh, I spend way too much time on my social media. So what I want you to do is I want you to really be a little bit more selfish of where you spend your time and kind of realign your efforts. So reader outreach, because this goes back to the slide earlier where I talked about 95% of books are sold word of mouth, reader outreach should be very high, so 40% of your time. Reviews and pitching, getting more reviews, also 40% of your time. People like what other people like. And I'm gonna talk you through some blogger tips. This presentation is really very packed, so I'm glad that it's recorded. You can listen to it again um, and go through some of the areas that maybe weren't clear the first time. Um, other, so 10% author events. I love doing in-person author events, and this may change for you if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, but Penny, you know, 90% of my work is doing speaking. So your pie chart might look slightly different, but the majority of the time when I show this to authors, they say, oh my gosh, I was spending half of my time on social media. And really, I want you to kind of cut that down a little bit more. In fact, if you have, as you start to identify other successful authors in your market, start to kind of see where they're popping up on social media, because that's a fairly good indicator of where your market is. If, for example, you know, if you're spending a lot of time on Facebook and, and Instagram and Twitter and you're doing all this stuff, but your audience is really on LinkedIn and you're not spending as much time there, maybe it makes sense to kind of curtail your activities on these other sites and invest more of your time where your folks actually, where your readers actually are, right? So, and like I said, we're gonna break down a lot of the, the pieces in this, um, in that pie chart for you throughout this presentation. So let's talk about specifics and how to fix what's, what's wrong because there are some areas that I think kind of goes without saying that need to be addressed before you can actually get some people buying your book. And these are some things that I have seen in my 19 years in business that tend to be um, pretty, pretty important. And, do tend to either drive sales up or down. So your ebook pricing, your print book pricing, the reason I don't mention that here is because print book pricing is harder because we're a little bit limited by how much it costs, obviously, to print the book, right? So, um, but your ebook pricing tends to be a little bit more flexible. Now, I was at an event and the folks from uh, KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing, were there and they said that when I talked to them about, you know, quote unquote, what's the sweet spot for ebook pricing, they said really from $2.99 to $5.99. Now, if this number sends you kind of into a tailspin, then I would suggest that you consider anything south of $9.99. So $9.99, $7.99, $8.99, something like that. Um, if your book is, you know, you also want to price your book to the market. So some of you may be listening to this and thinking, well, everybody else in my market has an ebook priced at, let's say, you know, $20. And some of those may be not necessarily textbooks, but I think specific markets like real estate books tend to be a little bit more expensive. And I only know this because I just did an Amazon optimization for an author that we're working with who has a real estate book. So that kind of comes top, top of mind. But the majority of books out there are going to fall into this south of $9.99 pricing. The reason I mentioned this is because, um, there was a lot of talk a number of years ago about having free books and 99 cent books. And I think that the market has kind of just become saturated and we are somewhat digitally fatigued by having so many Kindle books on our e-readers and we can't really get to them all and they were 99 cents and they seemed like a really good buy. Now we're much more inclined to get a book that is higher price, but then not too high. So books that are over $10, you should, you should have probably a platform for those. I mean, a platform, an author platform, because now you're pulling in existing readers. So I've talked to uh, attendees at conferences and they say, look, I'm a big fan of such and such. She came out with her seventh book in the series and the ebook was priced at $18.95 or something. And 
you know, this one gal said to me, she said, you know, I gobbled that book up because I was already part of her fandom, her fan base. And I really wanted the next book in the series. So this particular author had built up a lot of platform, a lot of credibility. She built up a fan base, et cetera. So she could really charge over that $10. But the reason that I bring this up is because many, many, many times, more times than I can even tell you, I see authors overpricing their books. And that's a problem, especially if it's your first book. The thought process is, is that I don't want to undersell your book, which I completely understand and appreciate. But the other piece of this is what authors often tell me is that they want to earn back the money that they invested in the production of the book. So the cost of the book cover, the cost of the interior design. And again, all very valid reasons to, to want to make your money back. But overpricing your ebook, especially your first book, and even your second, if you haven't really done a lot or you don't really have a big fan base or you still feel like you're kind of struggling, price it to market where the where the consumer feels comfortable taking a chance on you, right? The other piece of this is also price rotation. So if you have a number of books in, so if you have more than two books um, and they're maybe they're in a series or maybe they're not, it doesn't really matter. But you can price rotate your books. In other words, you can price one book at um, $9.99 and then potentially um, you know, have another book discounted to $5.99 or, and then offer that as a discount for a day and then rotate the prices. So that's what I'm talking about when I mean um, price rotation. Okay, so your book cover. This is a really big deal. This is a much bigger deal than most people realize, I think. Um, book covers are so important. In fact, we're getting ready to post a blog about an author that we have who I absolutely love and adore. He's a World War II. He wrote a book about his experience. He was in Paris during World War II. And he redid his cover. Um, and I recommended to him that he redo his cover. I was at a at an event and I was sitting in a cover design course and he had hand drawn his cover from an actual drawing that, you know, he, he had done this drawing about for this book specifically and he was very married to it and he really loved it. And it wasn't necessarily bad, but one of the things that they talked about in this, in this class was that hand drawings, unless the book is about drawing by hand, unless it's, that's what the book is teaching you how to do, tend to be really tough to sell. So he took my advice and he redid his cover and his new cover is just amazing. So part of the, part of this is, is really stepping back. Like if, if you're listening to this class and you're like, you know, my book's been out for a year. I went through this presentation. I'm doing all this stuff. And the one thing that kind of sticks out to you is maybe it's my book cover. If you've had people say, I wasn't really sure what your book was about or anything and that doesn't necessarily have to be negative about your book cover, but anything where you're getting, you know, the feedback that you're getting on your book is that your reader doesn't really, isn't really sure what it's about. Like when somebody looks at your book cover, there should be an immediate kind of aha, like they get it. And it's interesting because I was at, um, yet, and I do a lot of speaking. So a lot of times I refer to writers conferences that I've gone to, but I was at another writers conferences or writers conference, excuse me. And they were talking about the various tropes in romance, right? So if you have a romance novel, just for example, and you have a guy on the cover who has his shirt on, and your book is probably a sweet romance, okay? But if you have that same guy on another book cover without his shirt on, you're probably more in contemporary romance, right? Um, if that same guy without his shirt on is now lying on a bed with a girl or with another guy, whatever, now you're probably talking about something that's a little sexier, right? So the book cover really is that important because it will visually draw in your market. So if you're not sure if your book cover is exactly right for your market, that could be something, and it's actually a very easy fix because like this author, this World War II author that I mentioned, he's having his cover redesigned and he's literally just re-uploading it to Amazon and he's done. Like you don't have to republish the book and start from scratch. You can just 
post it to Amazon and you're done. It's very, very easy to do. So are you marketing to the right people? And this goes back to a few slides ago where I talked about get really narrow with your audience, know who your reader is specifically. This is a great line, again, that I picked up at a writer's conference, don't hand a puppy to a cat person. So what that means is, is you don't want to market to the wrong audience. So you want to make sure that you're marketing to your exact right reader. Let's go back to the example that I used about the book covers. So if you have a sweet romance, right, you don't want to market it to a group of readers who is expecting something sexy or spicy or, you know, something with maybe a couple of, maybe the the protagonist has some cuss words in it or something like that, where it's a little bit maybe more contemporary, not necessarily where she's, you know, um, swearing like a sailor, but just that kind of thing. You want to be really cautious about very focused in who you're marketing to. And here's the thing, it may feel like you're narrowing your market. So when I encourage authors to focus specifically on their exact right audience, to them, it feels like I'm asking them to narrow their audience to the point that they aren't getting as much, um, they aren't getting as many readers as they might normally get because they feel like they're going too narrow. But what happens with that is you actually end up pulling in more readers because if you're marketing to the right people and your book is obviously what they're looking for, right? They're going to tell people and that's where the 95% of word of mouth comes in. So how many times have you had a book or you've heard from friends like, oh my gosh, you've got to read this book. You've got to read this book. This is how most of the books that are nationally best-selling books. I mean, other than, you know, if they're written by, so let's just say that they're not books that are not written by celebrities and people who have big names and yada, yada, yada. So just folks out there writing books and then all of a sudden they become these massive bestsellers. A lot of it is word of mouth. A lot of it is, oh my gosh, you've got to read this book. And I have books like that, that I've literally almost forced on people because they're so phenomenal and they're so awesome and I want everybody to read them. And so that's why marketing to the right people is really important. Um, the other piece of this is age matters. So if you've written fiction, more than likely your book is evergreen, so you can market it forever. And you shouldn't necessarily stop marketing your book. But in some cases, your book may have aged out of the market. And those are the kinds of books that tend to be in, so health related, because health changes so quickly. Um, anything finance related, because finance changes so quickly. Relationships, ah, you know, you could probably be okay if your book is a little older, but that also sits kind of on the edge. So nonfiction does tend to be, it does tend to kind of fall into that age category. So make sure your book is still, uh, you know, current enough, um, because I think in many cases, I've known a lot of readers who have said that if they see, for example, a book about dieting that's, you know, five years old, well, so much has changed in that time and it does change very quickly. So you may want to, um, you know, give it a quick update. So your Amazon book description, this is really, 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 really important. Um, is it pulling in your audience? Do you have enough reviews? And we'll take a look at some Amazon book descriptions in a, in a few more slides. You can get a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, so some of your success tools, your website, you should have a newsletter sign up. And we're going to talk about super fans a little bit later in this class. You really should have a newsletter sign up. A great book cover, a great book, a marketable topic, and consistent marketing. Now, this final point, I want to stay with this a little bit because that's another thing that I find that happens with, author, with authors who are, you know, um, getting out there and marketing. And you do something for a few weeks and nothing really happens and you kind of move on and you get bored with it. But if you know what's driving your audience, if you know what good social media platforms or platform to be on, if you have a great cover and you have a great book, your marketing should stay consistent. So I don't want you kind of flip-flopping around doing different things. The, the marketing, the best kind of marketing is consistent marketing. So pick five things that you really want to do or if five things, you know, gives you hives, 
pick two things or pick one thing and do that consistently. And this is actually another one of the secrets that I've seen a lot of independent authors who I have talked to or worked with over the years who are successful, they do things consistently, right? So that's a big, you know, that's a big deal. The other, which I think is kind of a tough question sometimes for me to ask um, authors is, are you really doing enough? So I showed you the marketing pie earlier, which maybe sent, sent, sent you into a tizzy and I apologize about that. But, you know, I really want you to think about, you know, if you're in this class, you obviously want to realign some stuff. So think about whether or not you're really doing enough. Are you marketing consistently? Are you doing all the right things? Um, are you focused on, you know, are you focused on doing one thing a day, even if it's just one thing a day? Really take a very critical eye at what you're doing. And, and you know, try to stay away from the things that offer instant success and instant bestseller status. And I, sorry, I know I sound a little bit jaded, but the thing is, is that there is no such thing as instant anything. So you really do have to spend some time with it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have to spend years marketing the same book unless you want to, right? But the consistency of marketing um, and if you're doing enough is really, it's a great blend. And I've seen authors with very small mailing lists who do, you know, one, maybe two things a day with full-time jobs and families who still do, who are still very successful. So it doesn't take a lot, but it just takes consistency of the right things. All right, so let's dig into getting more reviews. We're going to talk a little bit about um, blog reviews and Amazon reviews. Pre-publication, obviously, those are reviews that come that you target well in, in advance of publication date. You don't always need those. They're great if you've got the time, but you don't necessarily need those to be successful. I love post-publication reviewers. I love you know, Midwest Book Review, we target a bunch of those for our authors. I love the post-publication folks because you have a bigger window, three to six months, and sometimes in some cases even longer after the book is out. Amazon reviewers, you know, the top Amazon reviewers are always the most, you know, the most amazing ones to, to go to. So um, that's, that's something that is, you know, that we'll look at in just a second, blogger pitching, which we'll also talk about, and then reader reviews, which are your readers, so um, your folks who are in, you know, in your mailing list. So getting more reader reviews, um, blogger pitching, one of the things that I really recommend, and I'm going to break down how to find more bloggers in just a second, I will tell you, I did an experiment with this author a few years ago new author, first book. And I said, look, I'm going to try something. So I created a Gmail account specifically for this purpose. And I sent out pitches as her because the bloggers, you know, because we do marketing. So the bloggers know me. So I sent the email pitches out as her. And what I did was I personalized every email pitch. And then in some cases, I did an intro of, oh my gosh, Darcy, your trip to Venice or wherever over the summer looked great. I loved the pictures on your website. So I'm not suggesting that you follow all these bloggers on social media and become BFFs with all of them. But a lot of times they'll post small personal things. Like there was one, one blogger who had just um, got a, gotten a um, shelter dog and the dog was named Library. She named the dog Library rather and I thought that was just so darling so I mentioned it in the intro. Slight touches of personalization make a huge difference. In this case, this author, brand new author, no platform, no anything really to speak of, got an 80% review request from those pitches because they were personalized. Personalizing your pitch makes a huge difference. So I, re I don't recommend like sending bloggers all BCC, dear blogger. Um, I know a lot of bloggers that I've talked to will absolutely go in and delete those emails. So personalize, you know what, they're human, they're busy. Um, don't send attachments with your email. I never send attachments unless they request it. Gift the book on Amazon, meaning you pay to send the book to them. Um, and if they don't like the book, they're probably going to ask you, look, do you want me to still review it? 
most bloggers, if they request a book, they will review it and they'll probably give you a fairly good review, if not a five star review. Finding top Amazon reviewers, I'm going to go through that in just a second. The top Amazon reviewers are really awesome, but they're also very busy, much like the top bloggers. Um, but like I said, we'll walk you through that. I had to find them in just a second. And national reviews, as I mentioned, like Midwest Book Review, and we've also worked with um, Seattle Book Review and um, a whole bunch of other places that will take your book post publication date, which is great. People like what other people like. So reviews are a fun way to get more, to get your book in front of more people and to get more people talking about your book. So finding bloggers online and blogger directories are great, but you can also just do a Google search of book bloggers. The challenge with blogger directories is I think, you know, for a lot of people who run them, it gets to be a little bit tricky just in terms of managing the list because book bloggers do come and go and some of them, then they have periods of time where they don't review books because they're busy or whatever. So those blogger directories, Sometimes they're a little bit hit and miss, understandably, again, because there are a lot of, you know, it's a lot to keep up with. I basically, I mean, I have lists of bloggers just internally, but if I were, whenever we want to add to our list and freshen our list up a little bit and find some new folks, we'll just do a Google search similar to this. So book bloggers and romance, which pulls up the top book bloggers in this, in this market, as well as, you know, um, links to top, and these get into the top romance book blogs and websites in 2018. These do get into a lot of book directories, but it's a, certainly is a great start if you're looking to build your blogger list. And you know, honestly, I mean, a lot of times, you know, people think, oh, I need to pitch a hundred bloggers or I need to pitch so many bloggers. A lot of what's happened in the last, I would say five or seven years is that bloggers have kind of merged. So there used to be like, if, you, if you've written mystery, let's say, there used to be a blogger who did cozy mysteries, who did um, thrillers and a blogger who just did, you know, your straight mystery mystery. Now, a lot of these have kind of merged. So your mystery blogger will also, also has reviewers for cozies and thrillers and, you know, uh, those kinds of things. So there are fewer bloggers, but there are more books under each umbrella is what I'm, you know, what I'm finding a lot. So just kind of keep in mind that you're going to be seeing that as you're starting to build your list. How long can you pitch bloggers? Because I get this question a lot. So you're better, you're better off pitching bloggers earlier rather than later. So the National Book Reviews, which I mentioned, is something that you could target between three and six months. By the time, and sometimes even longer, I pitched national book reviewers even nine months after a book is out, which kind of is pushing, pushing it a little bit um, far. But um, with book bloggers, I would really say, you know, if your book is six months or older, it starts to get a little tougher to pitch them because book bloggers, again, they're very busy. They really want something that's very current. But if you are listening to this class and you're like, oh, I'm too late to pitch them. If you have another book coming out, you can still do this work or refer back to this class later to go after them at a different time. So let's talk a little bit about um, Amazon reviewers because I have a lot to cover. So I just wanted to zip through. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on each of these pieces so that you can, um, you know, whatever appeals to you or whatever you decide that you want to implement. So one of the quick ways that I find to uh, look for Amazon, Amazon top reviewers is actually just going on to books that are similar to mine. So if I have a book, let's say on um, dating, for example, or, you know, um, I saw a book today about how to put down your phone. So in other words, you know, how to stop being on your phone all the time. If I had a book similar to that, I'm going to go onto the author's Amazon page and I am going to um, just look for, so you see DR, she's lovely. She does, she, I've worked with her a number of times. Top contributor, top 50 reviewer. She is my target. I'm going to go to her page and I'm going to show that to you. So you click on her name, takes you over to her page. She's this cute little dog um, and her, oops, sorry. 
and it also shows a little bit about her profile. There we go again. I don't know why that's happening. Shows you a little bit about her profile. She's done 569 reviews, which is really awesome. She has a lot of helpful votes. Oh, and it looks like she does do thrillers. So if I'm marketing a mystery book, I'm looking at D and I'm thinking, hey, but a lot of these Amazon reviewers review cross genres. So they don't always review like D doesn't review just thriller books. She reviews all different types of genres. So this is one way. And then you can click through a lot of times from this profile. Amazon has now, I think Amazon for all of the reviewers, I want to say has gotten rid of where you can actually click live off of the Amazon site, but the URL will still be in there. So you can look up D's website or the emails in there or something and you can contact them from, if you can't find that information on the page, if they are, as D is, if they are a top contributor and a top reviewer, they probably have a website, they're maybe even a blogger. So searching her name or searching their reviewer's name, you can find those, those top Amazon reviewers. But here's the thing, if you think bloggers are busy, Amazon reviewers are even busier. So make sure that they, A, review your genre, that they are currently accepting titles. You know, you just want to make sure that you have all your pieces in place. And then for sure, you know, email them, send them your pitch, keep your pitch really short. That's something we haven't talked about yet, but I think it's important to mention is uh, I recommend there's an old newspaper term, which talk to, talks about keep your pitch above the fold. So if your pitch is longer than, you know, a page, it's way, 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 way too long. I recommend keep it really short, a paragraph if you can, keep your pitch really short, and, you know, try to customize your intro. In this in D's case, I'd mention her cutie pie dog, and, um, you know, and then, you know, pitch them. I would probably start with five top Amazon reviewers and kind of see where you go and, and build your list from there. Okay, so now let's talk about advertising because this is something that um, authors tend to like to do a lot of because it feels like you're doing something, right? Okay, well, I'm, I'm running all these ads. I talked to an author just today and he says like, oh, I was running all these Facebook ads and I felt really productive, but it wasn't really selling any books. And I hear this a lot. So advertising should be a booster. Do not advertise, and I'm not saying not advertising, although I personally am not really a fan of Facebook ads. I think there's a lot of money that goes in and not a lot of money that comes out. Um, but I would, I only use advertising as a booster. And let me tell you um, what I'm talking about. So if I'm doing, so remember how I told you about the price rotation a few slides back? Maybe it was, I'm running a lot of slides, so maybe it was 10 slides back. Um, if I'm discounting my book to $5.99, which is the, the example that I gave you, or I'm discounting it to whatever price, I might run an ad for that discount. I might run, oh my gosh, the sale ends at midnight tonight, you know, get, get it while you can. That's what I mean by an advertising as a booster. Or if you're doing a free book promotion or something like that, that's advertising as a booster, not advertising just to advertise. So be really careful because you can spend a lot of money without a lot of return here, right? Um, I do love Goodreads. I do Goodreads events for everything. There's a lot of copy on this slide, but as I mentioned, you can always review these separately and pause them and kind of, you know, um, note all of the bullet points. But it, Goodreads events are a great way to support. So if you're releasing a book, you create a Goodreads event. If you're doing a talk, if you're doing a book signing and it's free and it's very much underutilized because Goodreads is a hub for readers. So what happens with Goodreads events is it shows up on your profile and it shows up for people who follow you in their um, newsfeed, right? So um, let me just go back. Okay. Goodreads giveaways. I like doing Goodreads giveaways. I know they cost a little bit now, but they also have a lot of, there are a lot of benefits to them. So Goodreads reminds, you know, have you finished the book uh, to review the book? So Goodreads said, does send a lot of reminders to people who have, who have won the book. 
And I typically will do Goodreads giveaways just for the ebook. I know you pay whether you do a print or an ebook, but I'll do the giveaway for the ebook and I'll give away a hundred copies because it doesn't cost me anything to do 10 copies or a hundred. So I'll do a hundred copies of my ebook. I love doing Goodreads giveaways. I don't do a ton of them. I'll be really honest with you. I have, as I have books coming out, I'll do one pre book launch and then post book launch, but I won't do them all the time. I mean, I used to do them more to be honest with you, but when they started charging, I got a little bit more selective, which I think was kind of their goal anyway, because I would imagine that when you're running a lot of the same thing, whether it's, you know, giveaways of, of, you know, 100 or 200 different books, it does tend to dilute the effectiveness of the giveaway. So they're more effective now. And um, because people are being more selective about them, but I really like them. Bookbub ads. I like running bookbub ads. They don't cost you a ton and I don't have the time in this particular session to break down bookbub ads for you particularly, but it is a really, really fun, it's a fun thing to do. But again, remember, ads is a booster, not ads to just run ads. So you won't spend as much money on BookBub as you will in Facebook. It's definitely a great portal, but there's also the BookBub profile, which I love a ton. And it's also a very underutilized um, feature in BookBub. One of the things that I recommend is getting in there and doing book recommendations and, um, you know, letting your, uh, letting your followers know, or as a way to build followers is getting in there and recommending books. Even if you only have two followers, start recommending books just for a book, a couple of books a month, whatever you have the time for, because it's a great way to build followers because much like, um, Amazon, if you follow an author on Amazon, Amazon will notify you that that author has a new book out, BookBub does the same thing. So it's a really great, and like I said, free tool. Set up the profile, recommend books to readers, grow your followers, it's a great tool to build more, um, to build more, uh, build more momentum for your book. I adore local media. So I really love local media. I think it's a great way to, and a lot of authors overlook it because you know, local media is not as sexy. It's like, it's not, it's not the Today Show, but it is a really fabulous way to get um, more attention for your book. And local media really loves local authors. So one of the things that I suggest is um, when you have a book coming out, or if you're doing an event, or if you're doing a library event, if you haven't done any local events, you may want to consider it. Libraries are great, or could be potentially be a great resource for you, or if you have a business book, you could do something in the Chamber of Commerce. But if you haven't exhausted your local media, you really, really, really should, because it is a great way to get more, to get more attention for your book. And it's a great way to drive more people to your website and to the book itself. And like I said, local media really does love local authors. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about social media, because it's not about being everywhere. I love this because it really kind of drives it home. It's not about being everywhere. It's about being everywhere that matters. And by that, I mean, we talked about a few slides ago, social media is really just a very small fraction of everything that you do. But if you are on, let's say one social media platform and you get a ton of engagement, that's a much better way to gain um, exposure for your book. Do I need to be on social media? I would say yes. Um, we talked about running Facebook ads. Yes and no, I would do them carefully. Is social media selling books? Social media is getting you exposure, right? So social media is designed to get you the right kind of exposure. And here's the interesting thing. I mean, if any of you follow me on Facebook, my Facebook personal page, I don't actually use it for personal stuff. I don't, because I'm not a fan just of that. Um, so I use it for, I mean, I share some, like I went to Belgium to visit my mom and I shared some pictures of that, but I don't share like really personal things on Facebook. Um, but what I found is, is that 
my, we also have a business page. My Facebook personal page gets a lot more engagement from new authors and existing and, you know, authors who are looking for marketing help and whatnot than my, than our Facebook fan page does, our business fan page actually. So I tend to use my personal page for sharing writer quotes and, you know, updates about my new books and things like that. So that's how I use that. So I weave in a tiny little bit of personal, like I mentioned, you know, the Belgian trip and stuff, but I keep it really mostly professional and it does, it really does convert very well, but I'm very focused on my Facebook page. I'm also on Twitter and I'm on Instagram, but I'll be candid with you. I have, you know, a team that actually helps me with those platforms because we just don't have the time. I mean, I would not have the time to be do, to teach this class and to go and teach workshops and run a business if I was trying to do all of my own social media. For us, it makes sense because I teach about social media, so I kind of need to be on all the platforms. But for you, I would really suggest that you really kind of identify where your engagement is coming from, where the majority of your engagement is coming from, and to um, focus your energy there and to get away from any of the other platforms that aren't really bringing you the kind of attention that, you know, makes sense and will help to convert into, you know, help to convert your readers. So I want to talk about, we have a few more slides. I know this class is long. I apologize, but I did want to cram in as much as I could in this, in this session, because there really is a lot to talk about. I mean, when somebody says to me, Hey, I'm not selling books. It, that's not an easy answer, right? Because it could be a whole bunch of different things. And so hopefully you have found that one thing at this point. If you haven't, we're going to talk now about um, how to build your tribe. So going back to 95% of book sales come from personal recommendation, your super fans, your tribe can make or break your book. I'm telling you, it is so important. In fact, I'm writing a book right now on super fans and street teams. And I taught a class just recently at a big writers conference about super fans and street teams. So we're going to talk about it. We're going to touch on it a little bit um, and, and kind of hopefully get you going in this. If you have a newsletter and you already have a mailing list, you are well on your way to this. If you don't have a newsletter yet, I'm going to encourage you to start one. Even if you say, Penny, I have nothing to say. So your readers and super fans are your super fans are people who are wildly and crazily crazy dedicated to your book so your super fans are people who are really interested in anything that you have your readers are maybe casual readers they love what you do but they aren't so you know they aren't really willing to share your stuff with their people that they're connected with and they may or may not review your book, right? So how to build your super fan list. We'll talk about that first. So I really recommend that you put a letter in the back of your book. And this is mostly, it's easier for the ebook because you're going to have a call to action. So you're going to invite readers to contact you. And you're going to give them a reason to contact you. So not just get in touch with me, but, you know, get in touch with me and join my mailing list. You can reach me here with a quick email address and give them a reason to sign up. So maybe they get a free chapter of your book. Maybe you raffle off a $5 Amazon or Starbucks gift card once a month. Keep your letter short and simple and make sure that it's very clear on what's in it for them. So Generally, I recommend to start off with, you know, dear reader, I so appreciate the time you spent with this book. I would love a review and, you know, put a link to the book, to the Amazon book page so that the reader can go right from that letter and click over and post a review on Amazon. You can also ask, ask them to just, you know, sign up for your mailing list. So I did this for an author that we work with and I actually wrote the letter for her and had her included in her book. And I said, you know, I'd really love to hear from you. Sign up for my mailing list. Um, everybody who signs up gets a free, I forget now exactly because it was a number of years ago. I think it was a free ebook that wasn't actually on Amazon. So a free copy of this ebook and <clears throat> 
maybe it was a chance to win, you know, a $50 gift card a year or $100 gift card a year or whatever it was, right? So there was the what's in it for me, the call to action was very clear, and the letter was really short. And when we did an ebook promo with her, um, and that letter was in the back of the ebook, she got something like 200 letters from readers. And those all got added to her mailing list. So it's kind of, so it really is a big deal and it's fairly, fairly easy to do. But if you're doing events, you want to make sure that um, folks sign up, you know, that you have a newsletter list, get people to sign up for your newsletter, right? So everything feeds your, everything should feed your newsletter, right? Um, I recommend that you, you can certainly put the letter in your print book, but they, it tends to be more effective in your ebook only because you have live links. So you have to tee up an email or uh, a link to your Amazon page to get reviews. I sometimes change up the letter for my own books uh, if I have another book coming out. So every time I re-release, if I update a book or re-release and release a new book or something like that, I'll often change up the letters in my ebooks to say, hey, get a, you know, an early copy of the, or an advanced copy of this book. You can order it on pre-order, et cetera. So sometimes I will change up the letter. It, it's, it depends on how you publish your book. It can be difficult to do that. But if, you've, if you have an interior book, book interior person that has done your book, it's probably fairly easy to just swap that out. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Amazon and then we will reach the end of the class. I wanted to kind of save the biggest, the elephant in the room as it were for um, the last piece of this because you know Amazon really is, it's, obviously it's a great tool for all of us to sell our books. Amazon doesn't really disclose how many books are on their site because they're very cone of silence, but it's estimated that there are about 7 million books. I expect that that number is probably bigger by now because there are approximately 4,500 books published every day in this country. So there are a lot of, a lot, a lot of people writing books, which is great, but it does create a very noisy and distracting um, page, right? So, you know, so this is, um, I just released the new version of this book, but this is the prior edition. So you can see I have lots of white space on that page and it looks, you know, looks pretty good. If I do say so myself. But then you start to scroll down and you've got the also bots and you've got the sponsored and you've got, and you scroll down even further and you've got more sponsors. And now somebody's trying to sell, you know, Amazon prime Hannah, the Hannah series. So there's a lot going on on that page. So one of the things that I really want to encourage you to do is to make sure, and I'm just going to flip back here to give, to make sure that your write up is really strong and that even if you've written fiction, I don't care what genre you've written, even if it's a children's book, make sure you have a lot of white space. You may not have bullet points with a fiction book, because obviously it, that tends to be more appropriate to nonfiction, but you should still have white space and you should still have bolding and different things that will help to drive the reader's attention. The last thing that you want is to have a bunch of text kind of smashed onto a book page. Because the other thing is, is that, you know, your book page on Amazon still has to convert. So if you're doing all the right, so if you, if you're, if you're at the, this is why I saved this for the end. If you've taken this entire class, you listen, you're like, Penny, I'm doing everything else right. My cover's great. My book's great. I'm pitching bloggers. I'm getting great requests. Maybe it's your Amazon book page, right? Maybe your book page has this smashed up text or it's not quite right. You know, the, the write-up doesn't really fit it's not strong enough, it's not enticing enough, it's not driving your, you know, driving your reader to make a buy, that could be your problem. So um, your book cover, your write-up, and your reviews, all really important. Obviously, your book cover, we started with that. But your book write-up, this is an example of a fiction book that we've worked on, and um, you can see where I bolded the, you know, bolded the first sentence. Lots and lots of white space on this page. We don't read, we scan. So you wanna keep your paragraphs really short and you wanna keep your white space plentiful. And you can have, you know, you can have, I wanna say 1600 words on your page. So it's not like you're only allowed to have 250 words on your book description. So you can have a lot of verbiage. 
and that's not a problem. I have no problem with having a lot of a longer book description because some readers want that much detail, but you want to make sure that you have it spread out so it's not all crammed together and jammed together in a way that is um, going to turn off your going to turn off your reader. So as I mentioned with my book five bit of book marketing, this is a better view of the description. You can see the bullet points. I always do bullet points. I have the bigger title. I make sure that I have a header title. I have a secondary header title. I have caps, I have bolded, and I just, you know, you just want to make sure that you are speaking to your reader and that you're pulling in um, that you're pulling in your audience into your book because that could that could also be the problem. So this was my class. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a ton. Um, these are my books and this is the slide with the download as I mentioned. So monthly marketing planner, reader profile, and they're all free so you can just grab them. And um, blogger outreach, tracker, pitching tracker. So basically all the tools that you need to do some of the things that we talked about during the class and hopefully be successful. Thank you so much for uh, taking this class and I hope that you learned a lot. And if you have any feedback, I welcome any and all feedback. My name is Penny Sansevery and my company is Author Marketing Experts. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bye-bye.